How lucky am I? Previously, this question was rhetorical. No answer was required. Of course, I was lucky. I had a lot to be grateful for. I have a wonderful wife who completely completes me. I had two healthy children who were excellent students. I had my own company, small but productive. Yes, I was really very lucky. The question does not require an answer. Of course, like everything in life, the truth of this matter is not as simple as I once thought. Most people think of truth and lies as black and white entities of each other. Yin to yang. Either something is true or it is not. Right. Recent events have shaken my faith in what is actually true. I score 9.9 .9 on the Richter scale, and my buildings are nothing more than a pile of steel, glass, and rubble. Today's truth does not correspond to yesterday's truth. What was once the reason I felt like the luckiest person on earth was now the key to how stupid I really was. I feel like Lois Lane, who just found out that her meek Clark Kent really is the man of her dreams. The question she must ask herself in this epiphany moment is, with all the clues staring me in the face, how can someone as smart as me be so dumb? You see, truth is simply a matter of perception. Anyone who has seen The Matrix can understand where I'm coming from. To paraphrase Morpheus from the movie, reality is just electrical impulses interpreted by the brain. What you perceive as reality is actually your reality. The earth was flat until it was proven that it wasn't. Man could not fly until the Wright brothers changed the truth into something else. If you think that all women cheat on girls who are easily accessible and you are only after the cheating of young women, then you are right. On the other hand, if you think that you have a loving wife because everything she does is what you would expect from a loving wife, then you would be right too. That is, until you find something that changes your truth. This is how my point comes out. But before we dive headfirst into my tale of lies, cheating, manipulation, and lack of good assholes. I feel like we need to understand how we got to where we are. My wife Melanie is 5F6 in, which can be described by the cliché, lady on the street, freak in the bed. I call it cool sexy. She wears clothes that flatter her yoga body, but never show more than a decent amount of skin. Her blouses never show inappropriate cleavage, but they hug her full chest and make it clear that they are, in fact, spectacular. Her dresses always reach to the knees, but lie close to the chest. Her lower half and round ass. Her makeup is never heavy. In fact, she does it so subtly that you don't even notice she's wearing it. Besides being beautiful, she is everything that I am not. She is patient with my impatience. She is practical to my sometimes impulsive behavior. She knows when to apply pressure to get me to focus and when to back off and let me figure it out. Over 16 years of marriage, she has become so involved with me that I honestly feel like she knows me better than I know myself. Perhaps that is why she managed to maintain her appearance for so long. She knew me so well that she could manipulate my truth. Like the Twilight Zone, it was responsible for everything I saw and heard. She made me believe what she wanted me to believe. My son Alex is 15 years old and a sophomore in high school. He is six feet one inch tall and has a truck-like build. He's the running back. No, let me get this straight. The running back for the state champion Seaford High Blue Jays football team. He broke virtually every school running record, as well as many state records. We have newspaper clippings about his heroism saved in an album. His trophies are scattered around his bedroom. I even got out of a couple speeding tickets because the cops recognized him in the passenger seat and wanted to let us know they were fans of his. Yes, he is so good. If you haven't noticed, I'm very proud of my son. My daughter is the complete opposite. Alexis, also 15, is just like her mother. In terms of appearance, she looks like a clone of Maloney. They also have similar behavior. Alexis is very poised and graceful. She doesn't worry much, but is rarely in a bad mood. She always had a smile on her face, but it was more like smiling was who she was and not because she was always happy. Alexis, like her brother, excelled in school. But where he excelled in sports, she excelled in grades. Everything came easy to her. She wasn't a bookworm or anything like that. She was just naturally smart. She remembered everything. 
if you had told her to do something a week ago and given her specific instructions, she would have been able to complete them with a C. In this respect, she differed from her brother. If you hadn't written it down in the playbook, you might have forgotten that Alex remembered anything. This is my family. This is my truth. Until everything has changed. Overall, I consider myself lucky, but I also have specific reasons. First of all, I was never particularly good at school. Yes, I was decent. I graduated from high school and went to college, but I was not what you would call a scientist. However, I was good at fixing things. While I wasn't particularly book smart, I had the ability to understand how something should work. If you know how something is supposed to work, then if it breaks, you can figure out how to fix it. Since I had this talent, I naturally moved into the technical field. I studied computers in college, computer engineering to be precise. Although I was able to bring dead electronics back to life, I was a complete failure at mathematics. I was terrible. That's how I met Maloney. She was a tutor. Besides, she was a senior and I was only a sophomore. Yes, she is two years older than me. It shouldn't seem strange, but people usually automatically think she's younger than me. They look surprised when they realize that she was the one who robbed the cradle. This may be because she does look younger than me, but also because our brains are programmed to think that in marriage, the man is always a few years older than the woman. Just as if we hear about a doctor who saved a life, we assume that the doctor is a man. So, she was my salvation in mathematics. To say I liked it would be a gross understatement. I can honestly say I loved her from the moment she introduced herself. Unfortunately for me, I was not Casanova. I wasn't tall or handsome. I was not a smooth seducer in front of the ladies. I was just an ordinary guy. Although I was completely smitten with her, she barely noticed me as anything more than another student to tutor. We didn't talk about our interests or anything special. We didn't really talk about anything other than math. To her, I was just another guy. To me, she was everything. Her voice was soft, but somehow hoarse. It almost seemed like she was whispering everything she said. Her hair and her perfume drove me crazy. Her hands were always soft when they touched mine. She was so sexy. When she taught me, I always tried to keep distance between us. I did this because of how crazy she drove me. But, innocently enough, she approached me to show me what I needed to see. It took a while to concentrate enough to learn from her. It wasn't until she suggested that I should try another tutor because I wasn't studying, that I pulled myself together and focused. When my grades started to improve, she became my main math guru. During this semester, I really got to know her better. Although she never really talked about herself, I put the information together. She had a best friend named Tasha. They have always been together. They went to parties together. They shared an apartment. They were practically inseparable. Tasha was the opposite of Melanie. She was very suspicious, and did not hesitate to express her opinion directly to you. She swore like a sailor. She was tall, thin, and somewhat awkward, which contrasted with Maloney's graceful persona. Nevertheless, they got along. I noticed that Maloney actually dated some athletes. She wasn't a team girl, but I could definitely pick the type of guys she liked. Nothing unusual. Tall, beautiful, athletic build. Basically, everything I wasn't. She did date these guys, but not long enough to be in a relationship. She might be seen with a guy for about a week or two, and then it would be as if she had never met him. She'd be alone for a good month or two, then start over with another guy. I can't tell you if she slept with them. I know she left behind some broken hearts. I had no illusions that we would be together. While I practically worshipped her, I knew enough not to be weird and not to harass her. She gave no indication that she was interested in me in that sense. Hell, we barely knew each other. I didn't have to go as far as holding tutoring sessions at her home for me to take it up a notch. No, we didn't end up in bed and became lovers, but I think that's when she started looking at me as a friend, or at least someone she was slightly attached to. When I first walked into her two-bedroom apartment, which she shared with her roommate, I felt like I was entering a sanctuary of another culture. I looked around and began to examine my surroundings. I have to admit, I almost laughed out loud. I don't know if you've seen Batman Forever with Val Kilmer, Jim Carrey, and Tommy Lee Jones. If you've seen it, 
you may remember the scene in which the Riddler breaks into Duplicity's secret hideout. Duplicity had two girlfriends. One of them is Drew Barrymore, made in the image and likeness of Marilyn Monroe at home and in the garden, and the other is a dominatrix from hell. His hideout, like his ladies, is also decorated to be complete opposites. One half looks like it was made by Martha Stewart, and the other half looks like a gothic teenager's Satan worship place. I said all this to say that this is exactly the impression I got when I first entered the apartment. I could clearly tell which things belonged to Maloney and which belonged to Tasha. Although not as obvious as the movie scene described, it was pretty obvious. Melanie was very neat and organized. Her belongings were organized and placed for maximum convenience. Tasha was not like that. Although not dirty, there was no order in her world. The first place she put her things remained at their place until she was needed again. Tasha wasn't home that evening, so Melanie and I had a quiet evening to study. Everything remained in the usual order of our times in the library until a rather drunk Tasha returned home. She didn't stagger or fall, but she was very brash and loud. My first immediate impression of Tasha was not in her favor. I didn't like her right away. It was like a cheese grater scraping against your skin. I'm pretty sure she felt the same way about me. She went on a long tirade about the double standards of men. She complained that a man can sleep with any woman he wants and be considered a player. But if a woman does this, then she is a player. It was just a form of control so that the man could do whatever he wanted and keep the woman under control. Then she looked straight at me, as if challenging me. Since I didn't like her, I accepted this challenge. Double standards are not a means of control. It is a matter of expectations. Both ladies looked at me as if I had two heads. I knew that having a discussion about sexism against two women was a losing battle, but I was already involved. Double standards exist because we expect a lady to play a certain role, because the standard for men is set lower in relation to sex. He doesn't have much to live up to. When he has two or more women, it doesn't seem as wrong as when he does. We expect that the guys will be low-grade dirty dogs. That's not news. But a woman doing this seems out of place. I'm not saying this is right. I say that the motivation behind this is not control, but the expectation of the role. Women also have double standards. Everyone has them. That's how the world works. She mocked me and gave Melanie a look that said, Can you believe it? Melanie seemed surprised that I had entered into a verbal battle with Shadeville and watched with increased interest. Come on, clear it up for us, baby. Please, I need to hear this. Tell me how women have double standards that are comparable to the hypocritical ones created by the male ego. She looked at me in disbelief, defiantly daring me to continue. Why is a housewife considered a housewife and a houseman a slacker? Or why is it normal when a woman does not bring money on a date, but if a man does, then he loses? Why is daddy's girl an affectionate term and mama's boy a reason to run away? What about household chores? Saying it's a man's job to mow the lawn, take out the trash and fix things is fine. Saying it's a woman's job to cook, clean and do laundry is sexist. I knew I had won by the look on her face. She was kind of stunned into silence, but still angry enough to release the poison. To emphasize the point, I added, See, Tasha, women have them too. We're not so different after all. When Tasha didn't respond, Maloney's laughter cleared the situation. Oh God, Tasha, did he silence you? Melanie playfully walked up to Tasha and pushed her lightly. I never thought I'd see this day. She scoffed in a fake Southern accent. Let's hurry up and tutor that stupid little bastard so he can leave. Maybe next time you'll find a real man to tutor. With these words, she left the room. Charming, isn't it? After that, our study sessions became more playful, although we avoided her apartment. We were still studying, but she started to be more open with me. It was as if I was now invited into her life. If I had known that pissing off Tasha was the magic ticket, I would have done it sooner. We started joking more. The friendlier we became, the deeper I fell for her. She had an incredibly crazy sense of humor without even trying to be funny. She also motivated me in ways that no one else could. For example, she bought an I'm with the fool t-shirt and wore it every time I did poorly on a test. 
She told me that if I wanted her to take off that shirt, I had to earn it. Interestingly, even though it was a joke, I worked hard to stop her from wearing that shirt. This, in itself, became a motivation to do better in mathematics. I knew I wanted to marry this girl on my birthday. I didn't even know she knew when he was. Imagine my surprise when I arrived at the library for a session and found a small box in front of it. Happy birthday, Jake. How are you? Don't worry about it, just open it. I opened the box and saw a pocket PDA. She wore the biggest smile on my face as she watched me look at my gift. This is so you can organize your classes and study time. I want you to stay on track and maintain your grades. I don't want you to fall behind when I graduate. I won't be able to hold your hand forever. She gave me a playful pout, but the words she said were everything but a joke. At that moment, I realized that our time together was temporary. She was going to graduate from university and move on with her life. After this, she will disappear. I will most likely never see her again. My birthday gift was so thoughtful, but also so sad. I cheered up and smiled. Thank you, Melody. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I have to keep my favorite student focused. With that, she planted a soft kiss on my cheek. Until this day, I do not remember a single gesture made by anyone that affected me as much as that innocent kiss. Time moved forward. As she predicted, she graduated from university. We were friends by then, so I attended her ceremony. She made the academic suit look like it belonged on the cover of Sports Illustrated. After the ceremony, I took her and checked Tasha out to eat to celebrate. You'd think a woman who got a free lunch would be less irritable towards the guy who pays. But no, not Miss Almighty Tasha. When Melanie got up to go to the bathroom, she jumped at the opportunity to put me in my place. You know she'll never be with you, right, baby? No matter how much you walk around her like a sad dog, she'll never give you a bone. She has needs, but not ones that can be satisfied by this little Vienna sausage you call your privates. The look on my face must have satisfied her because she leaned back arrogantly and smirked at me. Mel moved on with her life after that. She started looking for work and had very little time to spend with me. I was broken, but I expected it. I kept myself busy, trying to keep up with school, so I didn't have much time to be sad about her. Then one day, out of the blue, she called me. She said that she had not seen me for a long time and wanted to meet and do something together. I happily agreed. We went to eat and then watch a movie. Spending time with her felt so familiar that we immediately went back to where we were in college. When I drove her home, she kissed me on the cheek and said goodnight. After that dinner, I was pleasantly surprised to find that Mel still wanted to spend time with me. It was just like friends, of course. This time, we didn't need any excuses. No tutoring, no grades, just the two of us. We watched a couple of movies, went out to eat, did weird things like ice skating and finger painting. That was great. I really fooled myself into believing that we started dating. Again, I must remind you that someone's truth is not always the full picture. While I thought I had a chance, she was just hanging out with a friend. I was just a random bro for fun things every now and then. I was brought back to reality and reminded how casual we were acting. I got bored and decided to call Melanie. Her phone went straight to voicemail. I left a message and waited for about half an hour. I sent a message and waited another ten minutes until I decided to come in. When I knocked on her door and she answered, my heart sank in my chest. She opened the door wearing an oversized t-shirt and disheveled hair. She had a $20 bill in her hand and looked at me with a little confusion. Yaki, what are you doing here? I was just bored and thought we could hang out, but if you're busy, I might as well just go. That's when I heard a loud voice coming from her bedroom. Is this pizza, Mel? I can eat a damn horse. No, it's just Jake, she shouted back. Let me tell you that hearing her say those words put everything into perspective in such a way that my truth changed right before my eyes. Just Jake. Nothing to worry about. We can meet tomorrow, Jake. Now is not the right time. I call you. With these words, she nodded slightly at me and closed the door. On the way out, I met a pizza seller. I didn't call her again. I didn't answer her phone calls. I simply cut her out of my life. Or tried to. I knew it wasn't fair to her. She didn't do anything wrong. It's not like she cheated on me. 
She didn't even know that I had feelings for her. But seeing her in the doorway and knowing why she was wearing that shirt, why her hair was all messed up, and why that asshole was so hungry he ate a fucking horse was too much to bear. After calling me several times and leaving unanswered voicemails, she just stopped. Thus, our time together came to an end. I didn't see Maloney until a few years later. I graduated from college and was looking for a job. I got an interview with a fairly large company that specialized in the sale, installation, and repair of security systems. I'll give you one guess as to which manager will be interviewing me. It was Melanie. She looked damn fantastic. Her dark gray jacket and black skirt looked like they were made for her body. Just like that, all the feelings I had suppressed for years came flooding back. Oh my God, Jake? Seeing her was pure coincidence. She didn't recognize Jacob Worthy, whom she was interviewing, as her college friend Jake. I was just another person to talk to until she saw me. So my interview was just a catch-up for us. She asked me a couple of work-related questions, but I think we both knew I had a job at the time. The decision was hers, and she had already made it. Everything else was just semantics. When it was over, she hugged me instead of shaking my hand. It was so nice to see you. The feeling of her body pressed against mine, even if only for a few seconds, awakened feelings of long-forgotten lust. I didn't immediately get hard like some 13-year-old girl seeing breasts for the first time, but I can say that I got half a chub. I nodded in agreement and said, Yes, Mel, it was good, and I meant it. She smoothed out her suit and put on a professional face. We will call you when we make a decision. You will hear from me within a week at the latest. Then, with a strange look in her eyes, she added, Unlike you, I answer the phone. She said it jokingly, but at that moment I realized that I had hurt her by simply abandoning her. There was a small trace of the pain she felt those years ago in her eyes. I guess she cared about me more than I thought. Before I could apologize or try to explain, she flicked her hair and left the room. Just like that, she disappeared. Two days later, I was hired. She became my boss. As I said earlier, she knew how to motivate me. Under her leadership, I achieved enormous success. I liked fixing things and all that. But there was something special about working for her that made me raise the bar higher. I quickly became known as Melanie's golden boy because of all the praise she gave me. She always praised me in front of her bosses and made sure I was noticed. I was sent on the toughest jobs with the most demanding clients because I was that good. I began to build a reputation for being able to do things that people who had been with the company for years couldn't do. The only obstacle I had in returning to Mel's world was that she was still friends with that bitch. Moreover, they were still renting an apartment together. Even though Melanie earned enough to live on her own, she still lived with Tasha. The only difference was that they moved from a small apartment to a huge condominium. Tasha was not happy about my return to Melanie's life. It was obvious. I don't think Tasha had a single fine bone in her body. If it were possible, she would treat me with more resentment than when we were in college. Now Tasha has an addition. She had a boyfriend named Mark. He also studied in our college. He was now a Marine and was away often, but when he was home, he lived in Tasha's room. He wasn't a bad guy. He played football for our school until he got injured. Since he only went to college for football, he dropped out and joined the Marines. Over time, Maloney and I became closer. Yes, she was still too good for me, but somehow we were drawn to each other. I started looking for excuses to talk to her at work. I think she did the same thing because she always found me to give me information that wasn't really that important. Before I knew it, we were having lunch together. This was sporadic at first, but soon became the norm. We were careful because of the rules about fraternization and all that, but we did it anyway. It got to the point that if one of us arrived early, he could order lunch for the other and wait for him. This time, I was careful with my expectations. Because of my heartbreak in college, I didn't prepare myself for another failure. This time I knew that I didn't meet her requirements, so I didn't expect her to start developing feelings for me. Because I had no expectations, I was free to enjoy just having fun with her. 
Everything changed when we started spending time together after work, as well as at lunch. We went out for a few drinks or something to eat. I noticed that she was becoming more and more flirtatious with me. She touched my hand when she spoke to me, sat so close that our knees were touching, and laughed at all my jokes, even over those that were stupid. Then came the night that changed everything. The night we kissed, made love and couldn't stop. I will never forget that night as long as I live. It was such a defining night in my life that I still remember the date. I remember what her perfume smelled like. In fact, I kept the panties she wore that night. I didn't want her to throw them away. It's a bit strange. The night started as usual. We went out to have a drink and forget about the work day. She said Tasha would be out and asked if I wanted to come over and hang out for a while. She was ready to pick up the bet we had placed at lunch earlier that day. It was such a stupid bet that I didn't even expect her to take advantage of it. The conditions were, who could throw the most peanuts into the air and catch them in their mouths? The loser had to cook dinner for the winner one day. We weren't drunk when we arrived at her condominium, but we were quite relaxed. Okay, maybe we were a little drunk. The long story is short. I kept racking my brain trying to figure out what to cook for Maloney. I wasn't what you'd call a cook, except for Boyardi. I would have burned the water if it had not evaporated, but a bet is a bet. I ended up going with French toast, eggs, and sausage. I decided that since breakfast was the only thing I could make edible for another person, so be it. Anyway, I was looking in her refrigerator, taking out eggs and sausage, when I felt her come up behind me. I turned to her to ask if she had any bread and saw that she was looking at me, looking intently into my eyes. She didn't speak, but she conveyed something. I didn't know what I was feeling, but it was coming from her. We stood there for several endless seconds, the tension constantly increasing. I still don't know what came to me, but I made up my mind and leaned in. She closed her eyes, grabbed my shirt, and met me halfway. I've never been brave enough to do something like that. I probably wouldn't even dare to do this today. But, at that moment, I knew that she wanted me. She kissed me tenderly at first, then she became more aggressive. We kissed passionately, trying to merge our bodies together. I kissed her like a hungry man who finds a juicy steak, and she responded in kind. I felt her tongue in my mouth, exploring me. I didn't know where this was going until I felt her hand on the front of my jeans. I moaned in appreciation, then cupped her buttocks with both hands. I pulled her towards me, taking her hand between us. The only sounds coming from us were heavy breathing and the flapping of lips. Dinner was completely forgotten. We're lost in each other. I explored every inch of her body over her clothes. I squeezed the soft curves of her butt. I ran my hands down her torso and cupped her gorgeous breasts. It was difficult for me to realize that my fantasy and reality were about to converge, united. I've been craving this body for years. I dreamed about him. Now it was mine. I didn't even notice she untied my belt until my pants were around my ankles. She knelt down and got to work. Afterward, she took me to the bedroom. After that night, we became a couple. This time, there was no misunderstanding. Tasha hated our relationship with a passion. I hated it. As always, she didn't try to hide it. Mark also started acting weird around me. He was fine with Melanie and I being just friends, and we got along pretty well. But when Mel and I became a couple, he turned into the male version of his girlfriend. Snide remarks, passive-aggressive antics, you name it. He became a real bastard. Being with Melanie was worth everything these two could throw at me. She was unlike anyone I had ever been with. I couldn't speak for her, but I knew I was in unknown territory. I've had girls, and I wasn't a virgin by any means. But having a girl like Melanie was a completely different experience. She was so casual about sex. I never imagined her as she was. She also enjoyed role-playing games. I don't know if it was because of how we started, but our favorite game was teacher and naughty student. We alternated who was the teacher and who got the slaps. Maloney was an icon of duality. The Melanie she showed to the world and the one I got to know behind closed doors were two different people. It was difficult to separate them. That's why I eventually had to quit my job. It was becoming increasingly difficult to remain professional while working with her. When she was at work, she was completely absorbed in business. 
she maintained an artificial corporate image that conflicted with the way she was when we returned home. When she explained something to us, I saw only her in front of me. As I watched her sign the documents, my mind's eye flashed back to how she brought me intense pleasure. And I won't even talk about how she leaned over. We talked about this during our many conversations and tried to make it work, but we realized that we were fooling ourselves. One night she told me that she would have to transfer me to keep our jobs safe or I would have to quit and find another job. Then, as if struck by a genius, she asked me about starting her own business. You can handle it, darling. You know more about installing and repairing this thing than anyone I've ever seen. Why do you think that I always send you to all the difficult jobs? I thought it was because you like ordering me around. Come on, honey, be serious. You can totally do it. I could help you write a business plan and apply for loans. If you can't get a loan, I have some savings. I would love to invest in you. How much money are we discussing? I had no idea she had enough spare cash to consider it. While you don't like Tasha living with me, having her as a roommate saves me a ton of money every month. What do you say to that, Jake? That's how I started my own business. When I left work, she quietly helped me get started. I was able to get a small loan, and she gave me what I couldn't get from the bank. She had to keep her involvement in my business project a secret because she was still working for my main competitor, but she fully supported what I was doing. My business was struggling at first, but gradually began to show signs of life. Once it started gaining momentum, it became profitable. However, the situation in her condominium became increasingly tense. Mark was a passive-aggressive jerk when he was at home, and Tasha was just plain aggressive. The tension was so strong that I stopped coming to her condominium. We did everything in my apartment. I always wondered why Melanie didn't just kick them out. Tasha had a decent job and Mark was in the Marines. There was no financial reason for them to still be roommates. As time passed, it became obvious that we were in love with each other. The situation between Tasha and I got worse and worse. She constantly complained that she and Mel never did anything together because she was always with me. This made her treat me even worse. Mark simply supported everything Tasha did or said. Mel always tried to play devil's advocate and calm the situation, but she never put Tasha or Mark in their place. You would think that if two people make the man you love uncomfortable, you would do something about it. I'm not saying she should have stopped being friends with them but making them find a private place to live would be appropriate. Maybe I'm just thinking too much in light of my new truth. I suggested that we rent an apartment or condominium together and give them one. This proposal was met with immediate refusal and ultimately led to a dispute that lasted a week. It was such a big problem that I never brought it up again. I just accepted things as they are. Everything changed when she proposed to me. Yes, you heard me correctly. She got down on one knee and asked for my hand. At the time, I was extremely flattered that she wanted to ask me, but now I see it as a precedent for how tightly she had me in her grasp. Honestly, how could I have expected any other outcome? She led in everything. But I'm getting off topic. As I said, after a year of dating her boyfriend, she proposed to me. Finally, the happy roommates were convinced to move out of the condominium. Tasha looked so hurt, I swear she was ready to cry. When her pain was directed towards me, it turned into rage as she looked at me with evil eyes. I felt great schadenfreude. I also added fuel to the fire. When Melanie wasn't around, I whispered to Tasha. She seems to prefer Vienna sausages. Her expression was priceless. I moved in with Melanie and we began to arrange our life together. Six months later, we became Mr. and Mrs. Wardy. Tasha didn't come to our wedding. In the third month of marriage, we found out that we were pregnant. She gave birth to our twins a few days after our first anniversary. It wasn't until the twins were three years old that my business really started to take off. Maloney was still working at her job. Since our joint income was extremely high, Melanie convinced me that it was time for us to upgrade like real moneymakers. We started looking for a home and decided on a really large home in a gated community. We weren't living like millionaires, but we were definitely in a different tax bracket. The only downside was that our new home was about 30-45 minutes from my company. 
When we lived in her condominium, I could practically bike to work. It made her happy, so I just went with it. What's a little extra gas compared to a happy nymphomaniac wife? I haven't heard from Tasha and Mark since they moved out of the condo, but I haven't complained. I assumed Melanie still saw her from time to time. She made no secret of it, but she didn't torture me by forcing me to be near her. This was another thing for which I was grateful, another reason why I was so happy. Now that we've covered the background, I think it's time for you to learn some truths of today that make yesterday's truth look like complete nonsense. The truth about how I became so damn lucky. When Melanie was pregnant, we were both found to be carriers of the sickle cell gene. Although the gene itself is not sufficient to cause sickle cell disease, if both parents of a child are carriers, it is likely that the child will suffer from it. The fact that we were having twins was concerning for this reason. Although one child could avoid the disease, the likelihood that both children would not develop sickle cell disease in this situation was small. Oddly enough, both of my children do not have sickle cell anemia. I'm lucky, right? But this is not the truth that I promised to tell you about. It's just another moment where Clark Kent disappears and Superman saves the day and the big blue S under his tie catches your eye. No, the truth I have to share started with my longtime family doctor retiring. I had to find another doctor, and I chose one who was half his age. He had to be very good. At my first appointment, we went over my medical history so he could get to know me better. That's when we discussed a slight hereditary trait in my genetic line that makes my carrier seed rate extremely low. In other words, I am at high risk of being infertile. While we were discussing this indicator, he showed increased interest in my twins. His increased interest raised a red flag that made me think about things I hadn't thought much about before. My old doctor knew me and Melanie. He treated us and our children for almost two decades. Because he knew as much about our personal lives as he did about our medical history, he simply accepted our situation as it was. He may have had his doubts, but... Over many years of interacting with my family, it simply became a fact. A new young doctor, examining the same information with renewed attention, raised questions that had previously been simply accepted as truth. When I talked about the twins, he leafed through the folder with my data. I watched his reactions carefully. The wrinkles on his forehead betrayed his doubts. Well, Mr. Wardy, I must say you would be the luckiest man I know. Did he really emphasize the word luckiest? I couldn't be sure, but he almost sounded sarcastic. I can say that men with your problem find it difficult to have children. Of course it happens, but it's very rare. But for a man in your situation to have twins is truly a miracle. If I were you, I would start playing the lottery. This was my first insight. Most likely, it was a seed planted for insight. I looked at my life a little differently. I found it interesting that he was so confused about my twins. Although he was very diplomatic, he could not hide his suspicions. I took a moment to reconsider things and look at them from his point of view. A guy with an extremely low score gets his wife pregnant. The same guy, with an extremely low reading, somehow fertilized his wife's egg, so she became pregnant with twins. Hmm... Because I have been so lucky in my life, I never question things. After all, I had a girlfriend that I shouldn't have had. I have a business that I shouldn't have. Why not have the children I shouldn't have? But now, considering things in this new light, I began to doubt my luck. I wasn't completely suspicious yet, but I became curious. Now that I own a security company, I know many of you are assuming that this is the point where I should start acting like Jason Bourne and acting like a spy. You know, installing surveillance cameras and listening devices in your home and car. Sorry to disappoint you, but I didn't. This action was speculative and did not sweep me for a number of reasons. I would have to explain where all the security systems went. This would equate to a loss of thousands of dollars in income. I couldn't sell the equipment and install it if I used it myself. Installing a security system is not something that can be done without the other person knowing unless you can convince them to leave the house for a day or so. You need to run wires, carefully install cameras, and hide microphones. All this must be connected to a computer or configured wirelessly. If you're setting this up wirelessly, 
you'll need to connect to the internet and configure your computer to detect it. This is very difficult and takes a lot of time. Before you even begin with the installation, you need to do some pre-planning. You'll need to determine the best location to mount this equipment, what changes you'll need to make to your home to make it possible, etc. A good installation will take about four hours after the pre-planning stage. But this time period is for the security installation team, and that's only if everything goes without a hitch. It would take me days to do this myself, and there's no way she wouldn't notice. I didn't have extra time for this. This would require many hours of work, of which I had so few. I couldn't afford to spend so many hours that weren't generating income. This, in addition to the lost income from the equipment I would have taken off the shelves, would have put me in a financial hole. To do all this on the basis of one suspicion would be unwise. As anticlimactic as it may sound, the only thing I could do was keep my eyes open. The weeks passed, as if boiling a pot of water until it boiled. Everything seemed to move slowly. I kept a watchful eye on everything, trying to catch anything I might have missed over the years. I didn't find anything. Melanie was still the same beautiful, loving woman she had always been. She did everything a loving wife does. She would go to work, come home, cook for me and the kids, and give me a warm hug if we were separated for a few hours. Either she was really good at it, or she was who she seemed to be. The only thing she did that annoyed me was she dated that bitch Tasha from time to time. She was careful not to bring her to me because of our mutual aversion, but she still spent time with her. I was almost ready to give up and return to blissful ignorance. That's when I came across my daughter's hairbrush on the bathroom sink while brushing her teeth one morning. An annoying idea came to mind. Like any seed, it began to sprout into a makeshift plan. Okay, Jake, that's it. Do it. Prove to yourself that these obsessive doubts are nonsense and just enjoy life. I took some of the loose hairs from the brush and put them in a Ziploc bag. Because they were twins, there was no need to take hair from my son. A quick internet search pointed me to a company that does DNA testing. It didn't cost much, but the peace of mind is priceless. So I contacted them, made an appointment, and started the process. A week later, I was contacted at work with Alexis's results. She's not my daughter. I don't know if you caught it, but at the beginning of the story we're now back to, I said I had two beautiful children. This was said in the past tense. This was the truth of yesterday. The truth today is that although I still have a wife, I am infertile and have no children. My wife cheated on me. Let's go through our list of Lois Lane evidence, shall we? I know I was surprised when I did. How stupid am I? I am infertile, but I have two children. My son is a football star, although I have never been an athlete. My son is tall. I am short. My son has natural muscles. I don't. My daughter is naturally gifted academically. I was not. Melanie and I both have the sickle cell gene. The twins do not. Quite convincing, right? Today's truth changed everything for me. Although I am still proud of the children who were once mine, I could no longer look at their achievements as a reflection of myself. Let me explain for those who don't have children. When a child does something wonderful, the parent is naturally proud. But this is more than just pride in a child. In a sense, a child's success is a reflection of his parents. When your son scores the winning goal, you say, that's my boy. So while you are proud of your child, you are also proud of yourself. It was taken from me. I was no longer the luckiest man on earth. I was the stupidest. I did not immediately discuss my findings with Maloney. I still needed to process this new information and figure out where it was leading. Do I want a divorce? Do I want to try to fix everything? Who is the father of my twins? Was it a casual affair, or was it an ongoing affair? If there was a connection, does it still continue? These were the questions I asked myself, but I had more questions than answers. Before I could understand where this was going, I needed to better understand where I stood. So I started from the most logical and most expensive place. I hired a private detective. Even taking into account the cost of his services, 
I still came out of it cheaper and more efficiently than if I had done it myself. So a small team of three followed my wife for a couple of weeks. They watched how she spent her money. They listened to her telephone conversations. They were really thorough. What they gave me back was circumstantial at best, but it certainly added items to my list of Lois Lane proofs. I learned that she never sold her condominium. During all these years of marriage, I didn't even know that she kept it. By now, it had been fully paid off, so there was no mortgage. But even with that, I wondered how and why she hid this from me for over a decade. Things became clearer when a detective told me that Tasha was living there with her longtime ex-Marine boyfriend, Mark. He was kicked out of the Corps with a dishonorable discharge for using illegal substances. For some reason, the fact that Mark was kicked out did not surprise me. In fact, what surprised me more was that Tasha was still with Mark all these years and still hadn't married him. The biggest piece of circumstantial evidence was that Maloney came into the condo almost every day. I didn't notice this because it happened during the day when she was supposed to be at work. By that time, Maloney had moved up the career ladder to the point where she could manage her own working hours. So leaving work a few hours early every day was not a big deal for her. But why did she spend so much time here? I knew that she and Tasha were friends, but it was on the verge of code dependence. They spent time together during the day without my knowledge, but then still went out together when she informed me about it. As I said, there was no evidence directly pointing to anything, but you can see the evidence accumulating. Each particle was like a pixel on an HDTV screen. The more pixels, the clearer the picture. Mine was still a blur at best, but I had enough to realize that my luck was actually blissful ignorance. I thanked the detective and arranged for him to pay. There was no longer a need for his services. He was expensive and had already revealed everything he could. Any further action would have to be taken by me. The next few weeks were painfully ordinary. It would have been better if she had just squealed and screamed, I don't love you anymore. Instead, she was the same loving wife I knew and loved. I was in constant conflict, moving between anger, regret, sadness, and denial. Life seemed to move as it always did in the wordy household, but it was anything but the usual status quo. The only difference now was that instead of living in it, I felt like an outside observer of my life. It felt like we were on a reality show, but I was the only viewer. The struggle with myself caused me to become increasingly sullen. I barricaded myself in my inner fortress, trying to protect my inner child from further pain. My wife and children became the enemy, because being around them was too painful. I was angry at my children for not being mine, but I loved them so much that it hurt me to blame them for something they had no control over. Things became clearer when a detective told me that Tasha was living there with her longtime ex-Marine boyfriend, Mark. He was kicked out of the Corps with a dishonorable discharge for using illegal substances. For some reason, the fact that Mark was kicked out did not surprise me. In fact, what surprised me more was that Tasha was still with Mark all these years and still hadn't married him. The biggest piece of circumstantial evidence was that Maloney came into the condo almost every day. I didn't notice this because it happened during the day when she was supposed to be at work. By that time, Maloney had moved up the career ladder to the point where she could manage her own working hours. So leaving work a few hours early every day was not a big deal for her. But why did she spend so much time here? I knew that she and Tasha were friends, but it was on the verge of code dependence. They spent time together during the day without my knowledge, but then still went out together when she informed me about it. As I said, there was no evidence directly pointing to anything, but you can see the evidence accumulating. Each particle was like a pixel on an HDTV screen. The more pixels, the clearer the picture. Mine was still a blur at best, but I had enough to realize that my luck was actually blissful ignorance. I thanked the detective and arranged for him to pay. There was no longer a need for his services. He was expensive and had already revealed everything he could. Any further action would have to be taken by me. The next few weeks were painfully ordinary. It would have been better if she had just squealed and screamed, I don't love you anymore. Instead, she was the same loving wife I knew and loved. I was in constant conflict, moving between anger, regret, sadness, and denial. 
Life seemed to move as it always did in the wordy household, but it was anything but the usual status quo. The only difference now was that instead of living in it, I felt like an outside observer of my life. It felt like we were on a reality show, but I was the only viewer. The struggle with myself caused me to become increasingly sullen. I barricaded myself in my inner fortress, trying to protect my inner child from further pain. My wife and children became the enemy, because being around them was too painful. I was angry at my children for not being mine, but I loved them so much that it hurt me to blame them for something they had no control over. Not to mention I had to look at Melanie's angelic face and resist the urge to hit her with a rusty ice pick. The more angry I was with her, the more grace she showed me. She weathered the storm, hoping that I would find a way out of it. Ironically, the storm she was weathering was Hurricane Melanie, and it was destroying everything in its path. I was even angry at the doctor for opening my eyes. Until he came along, I was the luckiest man on earth. Now I was a loser who was too dumb to realize that his wife was cheating on him, or has already changed. Damn, I don't know. Melanie tried repeatedly to get me to open up and tell her what was wrong with me. She was so loving and caring that it made me sick. After several attempts that were met with almost aggressive resistance, she backed down and let me sort it out. She reminded me that she was here if I wanted to talk and left me alone. Isn't she attentive? Life slowly trudged forward like a zombie, dragging its dead leg behind it at every step. I tried weakly to appear as if life was normal, but I failed on several fronts. People at my workplace noticed this. My children and loving wife noticed this. Damn, how could they not notice? It was Melanie who got me back into action. One day, she forced me into the bathroom and locked us there. I was even on the toilet when she did this, so I was literally a hostage to the situation. Okay, Jake, it's time to... I looked at her through empty eyes. Time for what? It's time to act. You don't have to tell me what the problem is. I would like to, but you have your own reasons for remaining silent. But this cannot continue. It's killing you. And if it kills you, it kills us too. She pointed her finger at both of us, making it clear who she meant. I gave you time to sort yourself out, but time is up. You need to take steps and deal with what's going on. You are a warrior, not some damsel in distress. Get off your ass, slay this dragon and come back to me as the husband and father I knew. I sat on the toilet and cried for about ten minutes after she left. When I came out of the bathroom, I was a new person with a mission to accomplish. Melanie was right. She may be a liar and a cheater, but she knew it was time for me to act. She knew that if I stayed in this state for too long, I would die. It's time to get some resolution and figure out what the future holds for me. Time to kill this damn dragon. The first thing to do was. The kids. The condo. Tasha. It was all connected somehow. I didn't know how, but I knew it was so. If anyone was behind my wife's cheating, it had to be this bitch. I needed more than a guess to get the pixels. If I wanted a clear picture, I had to start there. So I decided I had to take a financial loss for my business to get the answers I was looking for. I started with small steps. I grabbed a couple of early afternoons, a camera and a notebook, and took a spot in front of the condominium. From what the detective gave me and my own findings, I knew when Melanie came to have fun. What I didn't know was what having fun meant. Were there multiple men there, or was it just one bastard who slept with my wife and used Tasha as a front? This bitch. I bet she just likes the idea of Melanie cheating on me. I bet she's sitting there laughing at how she can get to me. I watched as Melanie walked in and used her key to enter the condominium. For some reason, this seemed strange to me. But why should this be strange? This was her condominium, after all but she walked in there as if it was her home. She looked as natural as if she were walking into our own home. I couldn't catch anything from where I was. I also couldn't just walk up and look through the windows. The condominium was patrolled by security. The last thing I needed was to get arrested for voyeurism. I needed to get into this condominium and find out what was going on there. I was still unsure about installing the cameras. I didn't have a big enough window of time to do it without them knowing. 
but I could sneak in and quickly install a few wireless bugs. That way, I could at least listen when Melody was supposed to be there and maybe pick up something useful. I've entered a Jason Bourne phase. With a plan consistent with my mission, I received route directions. I took a few bugs from my warehouse and prayed that none of my vigilant employees would notice. Yes, I was the boss, and I could have just told them not to worry about it, but that would have raised questions and curiosity that I would have preferred to avoid. I went home and locked myself in my office. Here I installed several bugs and connected them to my computer. I also planned the best places to place them. I decided to put one in her car, under the seat. The rest had to go to the condo. Luckily for me, I lived in this condo before we got our house, so I already had an idea of where I could put the bugs. So this reduced the need for preliminary site assessment. The only thing I had to do was get them out long enough so I could do what I needed to do. Luckily, Mel solved my problem for me. She's such a good wife. Tasha's birthday was approaching. I found her on her laptop, surfing the net, trying to come up with a suitable gift. She usually wouldn't ask for my opinion because that bitch gives me chills, but this was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. I suggested a weekend in Vegas. Like this. I'm an evil genius. Mua ha ha. Before I could rub my hands together and twirl my mustache, I remembered that I had completely forgotten about Mark. He was no longer in the Marines and was just lying around the house like furniture. After he was kicked out, he went from the few and the proud to a parasitic leech. According to the private investigator's report and my personal investigation, he almost never left the house. But luckily, this problem was solved for me. Thanks to some top-notch detective work that would have stumped Sherlock Holmes, i.e. accidentally picking up a phone left unattended while Mel was in the shower, I read a couple of messages that hinted that the three of them were on the loose in Las Vegas. Since I wasn't even asked to join, I can only assume that the three are Maloney, Mark, and Tasha. This seemed strange to me. If Mark was the third person, how did he end up being invited instead of me? Now, maybe it's because I actually hate Tasha and it's her birthday, but it seemed like there might be another pixel there. After all, why would you want to go, let alone pay for an event that your husband is not invited to? However, I had to count my blessings. Even if it was wrong, Maloney's lack of attention left me with a whole weekend to get things right. Since it was the weekend, I had nowhere else to go to take my mind off my mission. So I swallowed my grievances and pretended everything was fine. Back on my Jason Bourne mission, I made sure I got a copy of the apartment key before Mel left. She was so busy planning everything that she didn't notice when I took the key off the chain and went to the local home improvement store. When I handed it back, she was still choosing a bikini. Even though I accepted the fact that my wife was probably still cheating on me, I couldn't help but check her suitcase to see what kind of panties she was wearing. Just as I feared, these were the best panties from Victoria's Secret. I swallowed back my tears as I left the room. As I watched Mel leave for her fantastic trip to Vegas, I was a whirlwind of mixed emotions. I felt like a winner. I had a plan that was going well. I was a little excited about the weekend and what I was going to discover. I was relieved that I was on the right track to getting the answers I needed. But the amazing feeling was the perverse appleasure I got from finally being able to manipulate Mel the way I wanted. When I first arrived at the condo, I took a few minutes to reacquaint myself with the place. There was no need to rush. I noticed a few changes in furniture and minor rearrangements, but nothing major. I expected the place to be a lot sleazier and more Tasha. I was surprised to see that it still resembled Two Faces Lair. There was still an equal share of Mel and Tasha here. If I didn't know better, I'd assume Mel still lives here. I slowly moved from room to room, trying to get a feel for the people I was about to spy on. I noticed that the master bedroom that Mel and I had once shared was now Tasha's. It was impossible to deny this, but the room that Tasha once had became Mark's room. If Tasha and Mark are together, why do they need separate rooms? While I was looking around the house, the puzzles began to come together in dozens. My eyes began to lose the pink color that had covered them for so long. 
It's funny what you learn when you look at things from a different perspective. My biggest aha moment came when I was in Mark's room. There were photographs of him with his family and friends. There were many photographs taken of Tasha and Maloney in different locations, spanning several years. Some were made in college, others appear to be more recent. But what struck me most was the photo of Mark in his school football uniform. He crouched down holding a soccer ball. It looked almost identical to Alex's football photo. Same smile, same eyes, same hair texture. The resemblance was striking. More points for Lois Lane's list. Mark was tall and looked like an older Alex. Mark played football. Maloney has always been attracted to college athletes. Mark went to the same college as us. I was able to contain my anger long enough to get the job done. But I couldn't get this photo out of my head. This bastard is my Alex's real dad, not me. He. When I got home, I changed my mind about not installing cameras. I didn't leave any chance for luck. I needed to make sure there weren't any loops left to make me doubt the truth. It was worth the financial cost. So the next morning I went back and set up a camera in Tasha's room, one in Mark's room, and one in the living room. It took several hours, but it was time well spent. On Sunday, when they were supposed to return, I set everything up online and got ready. I was fully prepared before their plane even landed. Melanie was in such a good mood when she returned that I knew she had a great time. She tried to playfully lead me into the bedroom to have fun, but I passed by O. There was no doubt in my mind that she had been sleeping with Mark all weekend. Her glee added to the knowledge I now possessed, and was the same clue I was about to receive. This was not a thing of the past. It was current. Baby, come on. We haven't had sex in months. What is wrong with you? I'm sorry, Mel. I have a lot to do. I'm trying to kill the dragon, but the bastard won't die. Yes, I know. Ambiguity. But she didn't catch it. She just playfully pouted and hugged my neck. Please kill this bastard and come back to me, baby. I really need you to devastate the princess. I'm on the verge of begging. Then she released me and headed towards the door. She stopped, turned her head seductively, and playfully added, But if you want me to beg, I will, Mr. Worthy. With these words she left, leaving me hard as a rock but sick as a cancer patient. You see, this kind of shit baffles me. She pretends to love me very much. She pretends that she wants me, and yet she goes out and has sex with that asshole Mark. What the heck? The next few days were as interesting as the prostate exam. I felt like I was in a time warp. Life around me flashed by unnoticed as I crawled through the quagmire of my marriage. Worthy's house became a place to avoid. But I wasn't the only one who felt this way. My children found other places. My wife worked longer or so she told me. I also tried to stay away as much as possible. Despite my initial interest, I avoided listening to and viewing the recordings. I started to panic when I thought about what I would find on them. It's one thing to know that your wife is cheating on you. It's another thing to see your wife cheating on you. Once I listen and watch, there is no turning back. I finally got the damn team together and locked myself in my office one afternoon and surveyed the damage. The first interesting piece I found was taken from audio and video recordings from the living room the night the trio returned home from Las Vegas. I was surprised to find something like this soon after they returned. They were together all weekend, so I just assumed Melanie went straight home, but it looks like she visited her lover and best friend first. Mel's voice. Okay, Tasha, I must go home. You know Jake is lost without me. He was without me the whole weekend. He needs his daily dose of mom time. Tasha's voice. Oh, God, you had to ruin a perfect weekend by mentioning the imp. Can you stop talking about him for five damn minutes? Mark's voice. Honestly, Mel, what the hell do you see in him? Mel's voice. If you two are going to start berating my husband again, stop it. We had a fun weekend and I don't want to be mad at you two. Tasha's voice. Whatever. In the video... I saw Mark shake his head and go into another room. Tasha looked at Mel from across the living room and I swear there was pain in her ease. Chalk closed the space between them. Gently grabbed T.I., grabbed both cheeks and pulled her towards me. They kissed passionately. 
a kiss as good as any she had ever given me. They kissed for a few seconds, and then Tasha suddenly pulled away. Mel's voice, Come on, baby, don't be like that. Tasha's voice, Don't kiss me like that when you're getting ready to go home to him. If you don't want me to talk badly about that damn Oompa Loompa you married, then you need to get out of here. Her voice was so full of anger and deep agony that I felt it. Even through the monitor and speakers, I knew what she was feeling. It was the anger of love not returned, at least not to the extent that it was given. I hated that bitch with all my soul, but we were more alike than either of us realized. Now I understood why she hated me so much all these years. Looking back, I see how she struggled with Melanie's growing affection for me. Subconsciously, I hated her for the same reason. I just didn't know it until now. We both shared an excruciating pain that became so great that it turned into unbridled hatred. All because we both loved someone who loved someone else. As Mel pulled her in for another kiss, I saw Tasha begin to melt. The anger began to leave her and was replaced by desire. Hell, Maloney had the same effect on Tasha that she had on me. She could turn your world into what she wanted it to be. You saw what she wanted you to see. She made you believe that half of her was enough for all of you. This continued until Mark's voice came from the other room. Why don't we order some food? I'm so hungry I could eat a damn horse. My world stopped when I heard this. My thoughts went back to the day Mel first broke my heart. I was on her doorstep back in college. Her hair was all disheveled, and that damn voice came from the other room. It was Mark's voice. List of Lois Lane, Tasha, and Mel have been roommates this entire time. I think we can safely replace roommates with lovers. Tasha hated my guts from day one. Perhaps she knew about Mel's feelings for me from the very beginning. Mark became a jerk when Mel started dating me. His little troika was in danger of falling apart. My son looks exactly like Mark. Nothing more needs to be said. Mel suggested moving to a larger house on the other side of town, but not selling the condo. She wanted Tasha to move in, but wanted to keep me as far away as possible so she could keep her two worlds separate but equal. Tasha said Mel would never be with me because she wanted more than my Vienna sausage. Yes, she needed some fish tacos. Everything came together at the same time. Mel has been having sex with Tasha and Mark since college. As I looked at the screen in front of me, I saw a loving relationship between two women. I wasn't the one she cheated on Tasha with. Tasha was the one she cheated on me with. I might have married her, but she belonged to Tasha long before I came into the picture. Children, house, marriage. It was all a lie. Tasha was the one who lived with a broken heart, a person in love with someone who has chosen someone else. At that moment, I hit the floor with a crash. I was awakened by the sound of my staff knocking on my door and shouting my name. As my vision cleared and I saw the room, the door swung open and my men rushed to my aid. Are you all right, Mr. Worthy? Do we need to dial 911? Step back. Give him some air. I assured everyone that I was fine. They hung around, bringing me water and everything, until I was able to convince them that my health was not in danger. Slowly they all returned to their stations. I stopped looking and listening. I had everything I needed. I didn't need to see them doing menage a toy. I had more than enough to withstand any lies Mel could tell me and allow me to continue living in Denial. Besides, I didn't think I could stomach it. I'll probably just pass out again and have my staff rush me to the emergency room. It's time for payback. I couldn't put it off any longer. I couldn't close my eyes and stay in the twilight zone. I had to face this new truth. Is it true? I went home early and did a little show and tell. I collected the evidence I had acquired and organized it. The only thing I know about Melanie is that she values organization. I told the kids to stay away tonight because mom and I needed to talk. They seemed a little scared by my behavior, so I reassured them that everything would be fine and that I just wanted some time alone with my wife. I intentionally planted the seed in their heads that it was a romantic gesture, but I didn't say it outright. What? You don't think Mel is the only one who can manipulate the truth. With this in mind, they eagerly planned to spend the night at some Frian's house. I think they felt that the sun had risen in Worthy's house. Everything will return to normal. 
I felt guilty for raising their hopes for something that was unlikely to happen, but I felt it was a lesser evil than going through what should have been a painful discussion. At least that's how I rationalized it in my head. I'm sure the truth is rather that I couldn't bear to see their hurt faces when they learned the truth. I would have preferred if Mel had had this discussion while I was nowhere in sight. God, I'm going to miss them. Once everything was in place, I waited for Mel to come home. As always, she arrived on time. Jake, baby, are you home? I met her in the hallway of our ridiculously large house. I used to like its size. Now that I know why she chose this, I find it a bit ostentatious. Here's my man. She sang as she walked up to me and wrapped her arms around me in a loving embrace. When I didn't return it, she stepped back and looked at me curiously. Where are the children? She said with a hint of concern in her voice. I told them to find a place to stay for the night. I told them I needed some time alone with you. Relief and a smile appeared on her face. Then her gaze became playful and seductive. Oh, my Mr. Worthy, why did you send everyone else away? Are you going to spank me again? She said in a breathless voice, doing her best Marilyn Monroe imitation. Very slowly and gently, she slid her hand down my stomach until it reached below my waist and massaged it lightly through my pants. Unfortunately for her, I was in absolutely no mood to think about sex, let alone get horny. All I had to think about was Mark moaning behind her while she pleasured Tasha. I grabbed her by the shoulders and pushed her away. No, Mel, we really need to talk. Her face changed instantly. Melanie, the master seductress, disappeared and was replaced by someone who, for the first time in her life, was not in control. She looked completely terrified. Fine. I led her into the living room, where I carefully laid out my visual materials. I had my laptop, a folder next to it, and on top of the folder was a set of keys. These objects, like the luck in my life, seemed innocent when looked at casually. They are just three separate items that seem harmless at first. But if you are a person with many secrets and lies, seeing them together can make you feel uneasy. They indicate that someone has information. If you are someone who likes to control information, your worst nightmare is not knowing what the other person knows. Right away, she could tell that something had been opened from the bag. I let it twirl for a couple of seconds, enjoying this new control I had. Then I started slowly. I started by handing her the folder. Do you know what's in this folder? It was a rhetorical question. Of course she didn't know, but I assumed she had an idea. I hired a private investigator, Mel. I had a team follow you for two weeks. Mel just stood there rooted to the spot, not moving. I thought it was very telling that she didn't ask why I had the detective follow her. She opened the folder and began flipping through the documents. The first thing she saw were photographs. Each one she saw filled her with a little more relief. I noticed some of her bravery returning to her. Detectives found no evidence of actual infidelity when they followed her. They just got a few things that made me think. The photos were just of Tasha, Mark, and Mel spending time together. She knew that I already knew that she spent time with them from time to time, so she started to relax a little. She then read an account of how much time she spent with Tasha and Mark each day. Worry lines began to form on her forehead again as she learned the described time she spent in the condo, or that I now knew the condo was still in play. It was the last page in the folder that dealt the final blow. That's where I put the DNA results for Alexis and me. She dropped the folder and screamed. I don't even think she actually read the results. She already knew what they were. The fact that they were there in the report let her know that I knew. Oh my God. As her world crumbled around her, I turned on my laptop and opened the program that contained the notes. While you were having your sexy weekend in Vegas with your girlfriend and boyfriend, I set up cameras and microphones in your condo. You know, those secret things you share with your lovers. Jake, do you want me to play the records? Jake, please. Do you want me to turn on the records? Her response was to cry loudly and collapse onto the floor. I didn't play the recordings. First of all, I didn't want to hear this nonsense. Secondly, we both knew that I knew. 
listening and watching what I had would just be unnecessary. Watching her on the floor crying like that broke me. I collapsed onto the sofa with force, as if my body had suddenly lost energy. The last few months have drained me. The tears I had been holding back burst out. The dam was destroyed and the village was underwater. We both sat and cried. I was sitting on the sofa and she was sitting on the floor. We just sat there and let it all out. Jake, I'm so sorry. I never meant for you to find out this way. I couldn't help but laugh at this. It wasn't real laughter. It was more like a sarcastic laugh. How did you expect me to find out? You certainly weren't going to tell me. After all, we were talking about the truth. Most of this was information I already knew. She and Tasha were college sweethearts before she met me. She tried dating guys, but it didn't work with any of them. She never found sex with men as satisfying as she did with women. In fact, the only time she enjoyed sex with a man was when she was with Mark and Tasha, and when she was with me. I don't know why I liked sex with you. It was just the way it was. You were different from other guys. I felt the same connection with you when we made love as I did with Tasha. Why did you lie to me, Mel? Why did you ask me to marry you? You asked me. You could have just left me alone instead of dragging me through your crap all these years. Why, Mel? Because I love you, Jake. I asked you to marry me because I wanted to be with you for the rest of my life. I couldn't bear the thought of life without you. But you also love her. Tears streamed down her face again and she nodded her head. So you just thought you could have both of us? Is that right, Mel? She nodded again. I jumped up from the couch and started walking around the living room. I put my hands behind my head and tried to breathe slowly. Damn the impudence of this bitch. She really thought she could have me, a woman, and another man on the side. But damn. She's already been dealing with this for 16 years. What about Mark? How does he fit into this picture? Do you love him too? She shook her head and sobbed. I love Mark. He's a good guy. He's fun to be around. I've known him since college. He was just in the right place at the right time. I dated him for a week or so. Tasha and I included him in our sex games one night. We liked it so much that it just stuck for years. But I don't love him. If he leaves tomorrow, I'll miss him. But I won't try to persuade him to stay. That's a pretty harsh thing to say about the father of your children. Yes, I was waiting for the right moment to connect this. Of all this debacle, this was what hurt the most. Do you know what you did to me, Mal? Do you realize how much you stole from me? Rhetorical, I know. But I was on a roll. I had two loving children who were a miracle to me. I had a loving wife who was only mine. I was the happiest person on earth. You fucked this. You've made me believe these lies all these years. Now I am a man without children and a bisexual wife who has a completely different life. Besides me, you stole 16 years of my life. You deceived me, Mal. Her only reaction was loud sobs. Why did you propose to me, Mel? Because I wanted to be with you. Don't you understand, Jake? I wanted you. Tasha wanted me to leave you, but I couldn't do it. I tried to get her to replace you with Mark. I wanted us to be in a relationship with her, but she hated you. She told me that she would rather die than share me with you. Then she gave me an ultimatum. She wanted me to choose between the two of you. I choose you. That's why I proposed to you. I made my choice. That's why she moved out. What happened next? She came back about a month after we got married. She said that she tried to live without me, but could not. She told me that if she had to share me with you, she would do it. She said she wouldn't. Not being with you like she was with Mark, but she wouldn't live without me anymore. She didn't care that I was married. She said I belonged to her and that she would just have to accept the extra baggage that comes with her. To me. So, even though you were married to me, you started having your girlfriend and your boyfriend again because she was willing to accept your extra baggage. And by extra baggage, I mean your husband, who you stood up with in front of the church and vowed to leave everyone else behind. Do I understand this clearly? I think hearing me say it out loud with such sarcasm and anger sounded worse than it did in her head. She began to retreat further, if that was possible. 
When did you realize that the children were not mine? After all this, this was the question I needed to know the most. How long have you been lying to me about having children? I suspected when they were born, but I didn't want it to be true. I ignored it until Alex played in the minor leagues, looking at him in this t-shirt. And that's all she found out. Nothing more was said. The only sounds were her crying and the death of my love. Not only my love for her, my love for life. Mal, I think you should go to your apartment. We divorced a year later. She did go to her condo that night, but then returned on a mission of her own. She did everything she could to try to convince me that she truly loved me. She did everything except tell me she would leave Tasha. How selfish do you have to be to feel like you have to convince someone to share you? Eventually, she accepted that we had passed the point of no return. She agreed to the divorce and did not protest. She even made the process easier. She told her lawyer that she didn't want anything from me. Although my business was still growing, I was making twice as much as when we lived together. Since we lived in a no-fault divorce state, she could have taken a pretty big chunk. She said she loved me enough to let me go. She just wanted me to be free. The news devastated the twins. They were victims of the same lies that I was. They begged and begged me not to leave, but I couldn't stay. Today's truth was too hard. Even though I couldn't stay, they were still my children. As I said earlier, truth is a matter of perspective. I raised them, dressed them, and loved them. To hell with Mark. They were mine. They were angry with their mother for a long time. They didn't reject her or call her a cheater, but they started behaving badly and doing things that could ruin their future. Because of this, I put on my father's hat and intervened. First, I didn't trust Mark to be the father they needed. I wasn't about to watch these two beautiful children fall apart because their mother couldn't decide whether she was bisexual or not. It took a lot of work and forgiveness, but they are now on the right path. Both started college in the fall. Alex received a full scholarship to the University of Florida. He'll be a gator. Alexis has been accepted to Yale and plans to become a surgeon. Mel moved back into her condo with her lovers when she left that night after our conversation. They succeeded for a while, but the threesome quickly dwindled down to just a couple. With Mel back in her life, Tasha had no intention of sharing her with anyone, including Mark. Eventually, the unemployed slacker was released back into the wild to be with others of his kind. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I was not seeking revenge against Mark. What's the point? He is unemployed and homeless. He's not even a figure in my life right now. I left him in the past with Melanie. Why live in the past, planning revenge, when I can move on with my life? I saw Mel at our kid's graduation. There was no way I was going to miss this. We locked eyes for a moment and she waved at me. Tasha pulled her closer and looked at me mockingly. I had no intention of returning her greeting, but my fiancé, Cindy, told me it would be rude not to. So here's today's truth. I'm engaged and about to get married. I have two beautiful children from a previous marriage who are extremely successful, and I will have another child when I marry Cindy. No, I didn't get her pregnant. I can't. Remember? But she has a child from a previous marriage. He was a liar and a deceiver too, so we have a lot in common. Yes, life is wonderful, Asna. Am I lucky? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.